Hello and welcome to I Thought I Knew How, a podcast about knitting and life and all sorts. I'm your host, Anne Frost, and this episode is being recorded on August 17th, 2021. I have an interview today with Ed Sutcliffe and Nick Corrigan of Project Lonk, a Yorkshire-based Kickstarter initiative working to get a locally grown rare breed wool processed into yarn locally and dyed locally and into all of our hands wherever we are in the world. This is time-sensitive information, so let's get to it. Before we begin, thank you to my newest patron, Amanda, for supporting the show over at patreon.com slash I thought I knew how. Patrons pay the bills for this project and receive some benefits in return. Check those out on Patreon. If you would like some alternative ways to support the show, visit ithoughtinewhow.com and click the link that says be a booster. That website has all my affiliate links and some other no-cost ways you can help spread the word for the podcast, including leaving a five-star rating and positive comments anywhere you listen to the show. I got a message the other day from someone on Instagram sending me to a post about a Kickstarter project called Project Lonk. I was ready to back them as soon as I saw that it was an effort to process the wool of the rare breed Lonk sheep from Yorkshire, England into yarn and roving for spinners and knitters. The project didn't launch until the following day, so as soon as I woke up the next morning, I was grabbing my wallet and getting signed up to back the project. And yes, anytime you hear about someone trying to get a rare breed yarn project off the ground, please let me know. This is something I am definitely willing to put my money where my mouth is about. Nick Corrigan and Ed Sutcliffe agreed to have a chat with me about Project Lonk, the whys and wherefores of the project, and the qualities of the Lonk sheep and their wool. So we did that this morning, which is a little over two days since the Kickstarter launched. But as you'll hear in the interview, the project is fully funded already. That said, there are still spots available for those who want to support the project. Some of the yarn and roving related rewards are still available, so this is your chance to get your hands on the wool and give it a try yourself. They have even already raised enough for their stretch goal, which was to uh, raise enough funds to have some of the yarn naturally dyed using the plants available in the area. But additional support means that they will be able to continue to produce this yarn for us yearly, and it will hopefully encourage other wool producers to take the plunge when they see that we knitters really can be quite nerdy about our knitting and that we are willing to support the wool producers out there when they can provide something special for us. Anyway, I'm going to start. (laughs) I'm getting on my soapbox here. Uh, Let's have a quick break and a song, and then I'll come back with my interview with Nick and Ed from Project Lonk. By the time this episode launches on Monday, the I-91 Shop Hop will be over for the year. I hope some of you were able to enjoy that. I know I loved watching the photos popping up on social media over the last couple of weeks. Knit New Haven is likely where you started or ended the hop, and Linda's welcoming, well-stocked shop works equally well as a cheerful jumping off point or a celebratory finish line. Did any of you find the Clinton Hill cashmere while you were there? If you missed it or you weren't able to do the hop, you can find it in their online shop at knitnewhaven.com. It is an ultimate treat yourself yarn. Check it out at knitnewhaven.com. The Morehouse Merino Flock Group is working on the Atlantis tunic for Open Farm Day on October 15th, the day before Rhinebeck Sheep and Wool Festival. Buy the kit for the sweater and you will have access to all the Atlantis tunic classes and check-ins and have a chance to dip your toes into the flock group to see if the instruction and community encouragement is right for you. Find the kit at morehousefarm.com and be sure to mark your calendars for October 15th to come meet me and Erin and Albrecht and Amy Snell and more of your fellow listeners and more at Morehouse Farm. Does anyone else feel like you are willing summer to linger just a little longer this year? I am not ready to let go of summer yet. Let's have a nice summery song today and everyone fit in one last road trip while you can. Get it on the calendar now, even if it's just a day trip to that bit of beach or a hiking trail or a local museum you haven't checked out yet. Roll the windows down, have some soft serve, and enjoy what we have left of the summer. This is Horizon by Close Kin, and I'll meet you on the other side with Ed and Nick. Let the world just pass on by I can't 
Ed, thank you so much for sitting down with me today to talk about Project Long. Nick, maybe first you could take some time to introduce yourself and what it is that you do, and then we can chat with Ed for a bit after that. Yeah, okay, brilliant. And in fact, first of all, thanks for having us on. It's lovely to talk to you about this. We could talk about Project Long all day long, so we do a lot. <laughs> I could talk um, about sheep or <laughs> I'm, um, I'm a knitwear designer and maker based in Yorkshire in the UK and I've been working in knitwear for almost 20 years now but I started off working in industry and then I've had my own brand Whitehall Studio for about seven years now and I've been going down that path that a lot of us go down when we start making our own clothes and knitting and we start asking a few questions about, oh, where does my yarn come from? Where do my clothes come from? All that kind of thing. So I very quickly got disillusioned with working in industry because I was working in fast fashion. Then I started working for myself and that was obviously good progress. But then I started to want to know where my yarn was coming from. And that opened up all sorts of, well, questions with no answers a lot of the time. So I design and make my own products and I sell those online and through some galleries here in the UK. And then I also teach machine knitting and run a machine knitting community as well. And now, just because that's not enough to be doing, um, Ed and I are, are now collaborating on Project Long as well. Yeah, on oh, this uh, Zoe at the... Oh, yeah, at the yeah. Woolist is working with us as yeah. well. There's three, oh, and Ed's wife, Laura, yeah, so yeah, yeah. four of us, Yeah, really. So yeah, that's my background. And I, I was basically looking for somewhere where I could get yarn that I knew was 100% British and I knew where it was coming from. That was kind of my starting point. Yeah, one of the things that you mention on the Kickstarter page is that the concept of British wool not necessarily being fully British and that it's often sent overseas for processing and spinning and things. Absolutely yeah to be classified as British wool the last part of the processing has to have been done in Britain so it can quite easily go all the way around the world a lot of it the larger quantity stuff will be shipped out to China to be scoured and processed out there it quite possibly will go to a completely different country sometimes Egypt sometimes Portugal 
to be dyed. It might then go back to China again and then come back to England or UK to be wound into skeins and the packaging put on it. And as long as that's done in the UK, it can be called British. So in my mind, that's I, I want to say that's a lie. It, it's not a lie. It does come from a British sheep originally. And it, ends, and it ends up the final bit in Britain. But in between, it could have gone round the world twice. It's not it that you don't even know. It's pretty much impossible to tell because there's so many people involved in the process. And I found that quite shocking when I first found out and then a bit dispiriting because you want to do the right thing and you want to buy British. But then you think, well, actually, am I adding to the problem? If I'm buying stuff that's being shipped all the way around the world like that in those quantities, and I don't know the conditions that it's been processed in, I'm not necessarily even helping either. So, yeah, so we wanted something that was really, really super traceable. So, mm-hmm. that, that, you know, we know the exact sheep it's come from. We know the exact mill it's been spun in and processed in. We know where it's knitted and we can share that and we'll share that with everybody. That's what I'm really keen is to make sure that we're 100% transparent. So when people ask you, where is it done? Who's done this? How much does it cost? You know, we're more than happy to share all those details. I think this is something that a, a small group of consumers has been interested in over the last several years. But I think that the lockdowns have really brought this issue to people's attention because of the interruption of flow of goods. We're all learning. People are becoming more sort of environmentally aware as well. You know, the impact that things have on the environment. And obviously, if you're buying something that you think is British, but yeah, it's travelled around the globe twice over... Right. You know, it's it's a bit of a mm. yeah, it's not helping. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Nick, do you want to tell us what you and your wife are doing there in in Yorkshire? It's me and Laura. We do the farming bit. So yeah, we're first generation well hill farmers basically. Yeah, we have three breeds of sheep. So we obviously have the longs, which we use because they're a hardy like local breed. Um, basically, they're kind of only found within a very small sort of radius area so anywhere from north derbyshire like glossop area and then it kind of follows like the yorkshire lancashire border up to lancaster so Mm -hmm. that sort of area you find long sheep originally that was like the heartlands from the longs and then if you go away from that area you just don't see them at all hardly yeah you know i talked to farming friends from elsewhere and you mentioned a long sheep and they've never Never heard of one, let alone <laughs> see one. So yeah, it's really quite unique. Again, they're known for being a bit cheeky and uh, the good, yeah, the good escape artists. So we have them for running on the moors because they're a hardy, tough breed. And then we have uh, white-faced woodlands as well. They're like more my wife's sheep, Laura. They're another rare breed, and we just show them and stuff like that is a bit of an interest mm-hmm. then we have a commercial flock of sheep as well it's it's geared up towards um fat lamb production with those so we use like sort of continental breeds and stuff because they're the best for fat lamb production so we've been farming now so i i started on my own about 10 years ago and then me and laura have been farming together uh, about nine years now so were you um, farming in a different way before then? Or are you, because you said you're a hill farmer, you made that distinction. Have you been in farming yeah. before or? In the UK, there's like different sort of sheep farming practices. Mm-hmm. So basically there's like lowland farming and hill farming. Your lowland farms basically will use different breeds of sheep to your hill farms because they the, the, the land's uh, better quality so they don't need as hardier breeds and the hill breeds obviously we need hardier breeds the ground's not as good and then different things like obviously we'll lamb a lot later in the year they'll lamb earlier and they'll be they'll be able to sort of finish their lambs off their pasture whereas we can't so yeah I think there's about 72 pure breeds in the UK so one of the one of the massive benefits of of what the longs bring and well Ed's way of Ed and Laura's way of farming with the longs is that because they're on the moors the moors have been designated 
sites of specific scientific interest, which means they have a lot of value in terms of biodiversity and mm-hmm. um, climate and environment. So they, we've got massive, um, or Ed has on, on Hutchinstall Common, they're massive peat bogs that are, are, are carbon sinks, really carbon traps. And the way that the sheep graze on those areas helps yeah. to benefit the land and the biodiversity. Yeah, there. it's a really sort of old fashioned way of farming. And there's a lot of people sort of going out of it, farming the moorlands, because basically your hill type sheep are not worth as much because everything in the UK is geared towards fat lamb production, wool's like <laughs> worthless. So nobody's catering for that. So everything's geared towards fat lamb production. So your hill type sheep aren't as good at, at that. The carcass quality isn't as good. So the financial reward from those sheep is like about half of what if you had like a sort of continental breed. So you're farming the moorlands. So you've got to use that type of sheep because they're the only ones that can survive up there. Then you've got to uh, manage them in a totally different way by the call it, uh, the sheep have a heft, which effectively means that the sheep will stay in one place without any boundaries. So obviously, like, you've got sheep in a field, it has boundaries all the way around, well, the moorland doesn't. So those sheep have got to have the knowledge of where they live effectively and they don't move from there. Because one of those moors is, did you say 2,000 acres? Yeah, so basically our sheep. Well, there's some other active grazers on Hepton Stall Common as well. But yeah, it's 2,000 acres and it's all like, uh, yeah, it's a bit like wilderness basically when you're up there. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's we've got heather, millennia grass, bilberries. So yeah, it's quite interesting when you go gathering finding the sheep because obviously it's just like a big game of hide and seek <laughs> right but so we go up two times of the year to gather them in so one is for shearing so we've just mm-hmm. done that now so we've been up and uh, gathered them all in for shearing and then obviously once shearing is done we'll let them back out onto the moors they're like practically semi-wild these sheep to be honest mm-hmm. because you can't physically go around 2,000 acres every day checking on <laughs> your sheep because you just wouldn't see them. And so then we bring them in again. It'll be like beginning of October, end of September to wean the lambs off uh, the sheep. And then that's it. We've got to have the sheep off over winter on the moors because it's in uh, some environmental schemes this day to try and help promote you know, a healthy biodiversity and stuff. So do you have pasture land you keep them on at that yeah, point? Or yeah, we have pasture on? land. So it works quite well, really, because basically we turn the sheep, obviously after lambing time, so we lamb at April time. So then we turn <laughs> our long sheep onto the moors. So then the pasture, so what they've been grazing over winter, we can then hay make for winter feed for the animals. They go on the moors doing their own thing, living free and wild. Um, <laughs> and then we, yeah, so and then we get... Um, a hay crop off the fields, uh, which obviously we'll use to get them through the winter months. And then once that's done, we fetch the sheep back on and then we can winter them on the pasture land uh, yeah, over winter. So I know in the past, before Project Long, you and your wife were selling the wool to the British Wool Board. A lot of my listeners I know don't aren't exposed to that. They don't know what that is. Can you explain what the British Wool Board does and and sort of the state of things for wool growers? How it works is it is a cooperative. It's supposed to be like farmer owned. You have a stake in it. But yeah, I mean it's I mean it was set up long this it's the la- one of the last co-op farmer cooperatives in the UK because they used to have the Milk Marketing Board, that's gone by the wayside, and then they had some others. So this is like the last one left. So to be fair, you know, I'm not totally against the Wool Board. I think they do quite a bit for the industry. They put on training courses, shearing training courses. They're always at the big, like, agricultural shows, and they, like, sponsor the wool events, because basically, like, people take raw fleeces and they have a show who's got the best fleece. And they're, you know, they're Mm -hmm. a part of sponsoring that. So they do do a bit for the industry, but basically the problem sort of lies with they're dealing in massive like quantities yeah. of the wool board. So in theory, 
every farmer in the UK should sell yeah. or should send all their fleeces to the wool board every year. And that's what the majority of them have been doing since it was set up in the, I think it was the 1950s when it was set up. That's what they have been doing. And then the wool board gather all these fleeces together from the whole of the UK and we'll try and uh, well, they, they grade, sell them. Yeah, they grade them all individually. So every fleece, individual fleece at the wool board gets graded. But depending, because like some of the grades I get back, it's like, it's just a number on a sheet. It's not reflective to like the breed or type of sheep you've sent in. It's just like a generic or it's a generic number. It's that mm -hmm. grade sort of thing. So they grade every fleece and then depending on what grade your fleece gets, it goes in a certain pile, you see. So then to the buyers, they can basically say, oh, we have X amount of tonnes of each grade that they've got so that's how it works and the majority one of the problems as I see it is the majority of those buyers that are buying in that quantity are buying for uh, for carpets basically mm -hmm. they're buying for hospitality and retail industry for carpets they're buying in massive quantities but this is the stuff that is definitely then being shipped overseas to be, oh, yeah, be yeah. processed before it comes back but it's under this misconception that British wool is only good enough for carpets, that you can't knit with it, you can't wear it. And that is just so totally wrong. And, um, you know, a, a lot of knitters know that already because a lot of knitters are already very clued up on sheep breeds. And, and they know that, you know, you can get your Shetland wool, you can get your blue faced Leicester, you can get all of those kind of things. And they're gorgeous yarns to knit with. And when, you, when everything goes to the wool board, it just gets graded and you lose any knowledge of what breed of sheep that's yeah. come from. It all just gets banded together. It comes together. a generic sort of fleece, one right. of many. Yeah. Because I think that's the trouble why the wool boards sort of struggled to adapt to the changing market because obviously they're dealing in like tons, like they get yeah, million, so many millions, millions of, of fleeces a year. Yeah. So there's only so many buyers worldwide that can kind of deal in those quantities. So you, you, your average knitter who might just want one or two fleeces, yeah. you know, it's not worth the wool board catering for those people because it's more, you know, if someone comes along and says, oh, I want two fleeces, or someone comes along and says, oh, I want 200 tonnes, you know, you're going to go for the 200 ton person, aren't you? But obviously that has a financial yeah. impact on the farmer and by doing that as well you're, you're devaluing the yarn a lot because some of those yarns that have uh, really good value good qualities it's being lost so for example at ed's wool the current price for it from the wool board is 15 pence a kilo so that's and on average a fleece is two kilos that's about 10 cents in the u.s 10 cents yeah. a kilo so you can see so, then yeah. why why farmers are thinking well my wools my yarn, my fleeces aren't worth anything so mm -hmm. from that perspective, from the farmer, you know, it's not a great experience selling your wool to the wool board. But basically, you've kind of got, there's very limited people out there that can, because I usually send in about seven to 800 kilos of wool. So there's very limited people out there that can take that kind of quantity of wool. So you kind of mm -hmm. all fought down this one line of sending it to the wool board the financial well you're not getting a financial return basically i feel like this is a, a fairly recent shift among knitters where they want to know the breed and they want to know what what's the characteristic of this breed's wool and how can i best use this breed that's grown over the last 10 to 20 years isn't it knitters mm -hmm. are much 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 not more knowledgeable i mean when you look at old knitting patterns back from the I don't know, 1950s and 1960s, they'll quite often specify wool, but they'll just say 100% wool, won't they? Whereas you look at any knitting patterns now, they will almost always tell you the breed that they're recommending for you to knit mm -hmm. with. With that, we know, don't we, that some breeds knit in different ways. They give you different qualities. They're better, some, some are better for colour work, some are better for cable, some are fancy, better for lace, you know, all those different things. As well, that's matched by the farmer. You know, I'm and all my friends, we really enjoy keeping sheep and keep, you know, keeping the different breeds. And, you know, that it's not just me. You know, I, you know, I've wanted to do something different with my wool. 
for a long time. I didn't know what to do. And I talked mm-hmm. to all my friends and they're exactly the same. You know, we just, there's no sort of clear route to do anything with it. I mean, I'm really fortunate uh, that obviously I'm, we've met Nick and now I'm a part, we're, we're setting this project up, you know, to see if it's doable. So yeah, it's definitely matched by the farm. There's a lot of pride out there uh, with the sheep and mm-hmm. everyone's kind of sort of disappointed by the fact that, you know, it's such a good product, the wool, and it's like, it's totally, you know, each breed's totally different. But then, yeah, it just all, you know, becomes like a generic wool. Would you like to share how the connection was made? It's actually a really interesting story, I think, about how you two and Zoe all got connected to form this project. Yeah, so you, you kind of you understand now where we we're both coming from. Right. Ed obviously had all this wool, he wanted to do something with it, didn't have a clue what to do with it. I was knitting all this stuff. I wanted decent wool. I couldn't find any that was local to me. Um, it just all happened through Instagram. Ed already had an Instagram account. He used to put his stuff on there about farming. And I saw that he was in Hebden Bridge, which is, is near to where I live. So I just sent him a direct message and said, oh, this is interesting. What do you, what do, you do with your fleeces? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and where exactly are you? And he said, oh, well, I'm in Hepton stall. Um, and I don't, know, I don't know what to do with my fleeces. And I said, oh, that's interesting. I'm in Hepton stall as well, which is like a very yeah. small village of about a thousand people. Be less than um, that, really. And I'm looking for some wool. Maybe we can do something together. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really how it started from there. And this was about last autumn, September. Yeah, October. yeah, it would have been, yeah, yeah. So we've not even, it's not even a year yet that we've been yeah. talking. Because mm-hmm. I knew, like, when I, before I met Nick, I knew, obviously, once it, I've sheared it, put it in a bag, I knew nothing about, like, the next stage. Because I was like, yeah. Nick, oh, yeah, here's some, here's some wool, some raw fleece. And then Nick's like, well, I can't do anything with that. It's got to be spun up. And then I'm like, oh, bloody hell, what do I do now? So <laughs> anyway, I had to find someone that did hand spinning. So it was like, right, posted them two long fleeces out, got it hand spun, got it back, and then obviously gave it to Nick. And yeah. then... Yeah, and that's, that's when yeah. it, it was at least in a, in a state that I could do something with. And then <laughs> Zoe came on board as well. So I met Zoe through my machine knit community and she's a specialist. She's got a PhD in wool, British wool specifically. Mm-hmm. And so she'd done loads of research into all the different breeds and what they're different for, what they're good for, all that kind of stuff. And so she was like the missing piece between us because she could give yeah. us all that information about how you get it processed and what works well and what doesn't. And so with the three of us, we kind of found that we've got all the pieces of the jigsaw. We might actually be able to do something with this and produce some um, really lovely yarn at the end of it. So it's been so exciting. But yeah, because for me, obviously you you had a Zoom meeting, didn't you, with Zoe? And she invited me to join. So I thought, oh yeah, I'll go on. So we're part of this Zoom meeting and I came away realising this was like the crucial point, that there's a complete gap between the end consumer, your knitter, and the producer. Mm. There's just a, there's a gap there. So yeah. we kind of all cottoned on to that fairly quick because like Nick and Zoe talk about stuff that I just don't have a clue about at all. <laughs> I'm, I'm learning slowly. And then obviously, like, once I get going about farming and, and things like that, it's all yeah. new for Nick and Zoe. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, so, like, with Project Long, this is what we're trying to bridge the gap a little bit yeah. between, you know, a producer like myself and a consumer. Yeah, and one of our hopes from this project that comes out of it is that we can offer some kind of tool to other people at either end of the scale that makes it a bit easier for them to navigate because we've had to do so much legwork Mm-hmm. Yeah. To, yeah, to join up these pieces, and it would be great if we could help other people if they want to do the same thing. So this is why we're talking today is is yeah. because of Project Long. I was just minding my own business the other day, and one of my listeners connected me to one of the Instagram posts about Project Long, and it was about is going to go live the following day. And so I went over to the Kickstarter and was reading, and I got as far as. You know, the project was to get some locally produced wool, produced locally, you know, uh, into yarn. And I was like, all right, well, take my money. 
Um, and then I've been trying to read up more about Long Wool since then. You all woke up this morning to the project being fully funded, which is wonderful. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we, we were a bit, yeah. there were a few discussions about what we sh- you know what we should set the target as one well. there we're all a bit nervous and yeah. yeah you know but yeah it's just amazing to be able to achieve that in 48 yeah. hours it just yeah can't believe it so yeah thank yeah. you for everyone that's pledged yeah it, it, it's been a great journey I mean this is really only the start of it as well that's the thing um but it's so nice to have that validation and you know we were seeing people sharing it on social media and being really really supportive and it's, you know, we said we've had this question in our head, there's this disconnect, there's this missing part. And Ed was suddenly aware of all these people who might be interested in having yarn from his sheep that he knew nothing about. And then all of a sudden we're getting these comments. It's like, he's like, yeah, there are people out there that actually want my yarn as well. And, um, yeah, I was like, up until now, I was totally unaware of, you know, this side of things. I've even had a woman message in there. Uh, wanting a couple of raw fleeces and the, basically the price of these raw fleeces is like I'd have to sell 20 or 30 to the wool board raw fleeces to to match what she's willing to give me for two it's just like it's mm. just bonkers yeah so it's, yeah. it's a bit like it's quite sad and and um makes me angry sometimes when you see some of these press articles saying well wool's not worth anything anymore and it's just well it is but somebody's just got to get it to the right people. It will work right. a lot, a lot of people. It's just not getting yeah. to them at it's, the moment. Yeah. I, I mean, it's not sort of trickling down to the producer, it, is it? Someone's kind yeah, of... It is, it is happening. There are lots of people out there doing really, really good stuff, fantastic stuff, but it's all, all, all over the place. And, and that's, I guess, the thing, especially from the farmer's point of view, is that the majority of them won't be knitters, so they'll be completely unaware of it. For many of us, knitting is a slippery slope where we we start knitting and then we start asking questions about the the supplies Absolutely. we're using. And a lot of us get hyper focused on wool specifically and want to know where it came from and the different breeds and the different quantities. So when you hear about a rare breed that only is raised in a small strip of of part of a country, you know, then you're like, yeah, I want to get my hands on that and give that a try also. Absolutely. So it's, it's fully funded, but there's still slots available for people who want to contribute to the project who want to, to get their hands on some of the, um, the yarn or you are offering roving too, correct? Yeah, yeah. I uh, have that right. We've been very careful in our calculations on our Mm -hmm. rewards so that we know we definitely have enough to fulfill all the rewards that are on that. And there are still a few, although they sold very, very quickly, far quicker than we dreamed of. Um, there are still a few of the fibre related rewards left. So we've got wool tops, hand knitting yarn and machine knitting yarn. But the quantities we've got on there are the last that we can guarantee. Mm-hmm. So when those pledges have gone, those have gone. For, for this crowdfunding, what, what will happen is because it's, a, it's quite an imprecise process, getting it processed from this stage from the fleet, you don't know exactly how much you're going to lose during um, the scouring, the the, the carding, the spinning, we're, we're taking over 200 kilos of fleece to the mill and um, we're estimating that we will lose up to maybe 50% of that from the start. Mm. So, but we've done all our calculations and we know that the pledges on there, we can absolutely guarantee. But once it's finished, if we have extra left at that point, we will sell that at a later date. But there are other pledges on there as well that are non-fiber related if people want to support us in other ways too. So yeah, yeah. It's still still open for another 27 and a half days yet, even yeah. though we're fully funded, which yeah. is amazing. But we are looking at some stretch goals, one of which is hand-dyed, um, natural dyed yarn with some of the yarn we still have left, because that was one of the things we really dreamt about doing. We've done some practice. And one of the specifics of long wool above other breeds is it takes natural dyes really, really well. So if anyone follows us on Instagram, there's some images there of it already dyed up in in very small batches using plants that grow in the area where the sheep roam. So we've got nettles, brambles, heather, 
all um so it yeah really really beautiful yeah night. we had a funny conversation about the dying didn't we yeah uh, the lady who's done the dying for me she she sent me a list and says oh edward uh do, they, do these like, species of plants grow on your farm? And I'm like, well, yeah, they do, but they're all the weeds. I don't want them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so another another thing that had been undervalued on uh, Ed's farm is all, all of that as well. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's one of our stretch goals now that we're just scoping out how we're going to be able to offer that. So that should be on in the next couple of days on yeah. the Kickstarter. Yeah, and... Uh, the response we've had already is absolutely amazing. And we did have other sort of plans in the pipeline, didn't we? So any extra funding um, that, you know, we can get and people are willing to support us, then hopefully we can use that to sort of bring, because we do want to try, we've had such an amazing response already. You know, we do want to try and keep it going and grow it um, and get more available to more people. So hopefully mm-hmm. an extra funding we can use towards up, doing that in the future i assume you've had a chance to work with the yarn already i have yeah this is can you can you describe you wearing your jumper uh, oh yeah <laughs> a jumper upstairs yeah so before ed and i had kind of started collaborating he'd already sent a couple of fleeces off for hand spinning so he, he had already got the ball rolling all on his own so i got to get my hands on that so i've been um knitting with the hand spun yarn um both hand knit and machine knit and it's lovely it's it's beautiful to knit with obviously because this is hand spun it doesn't have the consistency of weight and gauge that um, that a commercially spun yarn would have but i've knitted um some wrist warmers and i've done a, a my first jumper with it so i've done a cable fronted jumper and the cables come out beautifully it gives a real nice depth to them Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm excited to try when we get some more to try some different textured stitches like some tuck stitches and that kind of thing as well but it really seems to give nice definition and like I say it definitely takes the dye beautifully so those are the two things I'm really excited about getting to try when this is this is going to be the frustrating bit now we're going to send it to the mill and it's about eight weeks before we get the yarn back so we're all going to be sitting there going oh come on come on come on just waiting (laughs) Lonk is such a rare breed and yeah. so few of us have come across it before. Is there a, a type of wool available that you could compare it to for us um, as far as the knitting? It is quite different to some of the more popular ones like um, Blue Face Leicester and the Shetlands and those kind of ones which are probably better known. It, again, and I'm only comparing so far the hand spun that I've seen, not the commercially spun, right. but it's quite light and airy. The one it's most similar to is Derbyshire Gritstone, but again, that's not really a very well-known one either. So That's another rare breed. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, so, like I say, it's great for cables, it's great for stitch definition, it's great for hand dyeing as well, but it's, it is very different from Blue Face Leicester and Shetland. Blue Face Leicester is, is softer, This, uh, but this is nice and light and airy. So, yeah, it, I'll be able to say even more when when we get the next batch back and I can um, really go to town with it because I was limited on quantities as well. So I'm like testing away and it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. The amount of yarn I've got left. <laughs> thank you again for, sh- first of all, thank you for coming on the show. Secondly, thank you for doing this because I think that, um, as I said before, I think a lot of us knitters, we really turn into wool nerds. And we really appreciate having the opportunity to work with specific breed yarns. And so to see this coming on the market uh, and becoming available for us is like, it's exciting. You know, it's something we didn't have access to before and now we do. So thank you for making this available to us. And thank you for the work you do because it's, it's because of people like you as well that, that have built up this demand and interest in knitting nerdiness um but it, yeah it it's great you know um it's such a fun project to work on and you're doing something that brings pleasure and joy to people which is yeah. really nice oh, and thank you from farm inside from me and my wife laura it's just amazing to actually think that our wool we're gonna have a connection with loads of different people now because our wool from our farm instead of it just going 
to the wool board and becoming a generic fleece. You know, it's going to go to people and they're going to make things out of it and people are going to be sharing ideas and putting uh, pictures up and starting conversations. Yeah. yeah, it's just it's just amazing, really, that our wool from our little farm in Yorkshire is yeah. going to go, like, all over. Yeah, yeah. really happy about that. I love that. <laughs> I love that so people need to know how to find find you and find Project Long. Can you give us your contact information? Okay. So the Kickstarter is on kickstarter.com. And um, yeah, you just search for Project Lonk, L-O-N-K, all one word on there and it will, it will bring it up. And then we are also on Instagram and Twitter with uh, at Project Lonk, all one word. And then that will link to our individual Instagram yeah, yeah. accounts as well for our other... Um, so for my Nick West studio and for Ed and Laura's farm and for Zoe's Woolis business as well. So that's the easiest way for people to check in with us. Well, everybody get over there and get your hands on some of the yarn while you can. <laughs> and get, when you get some, give us some feedback. We love to hear some feedback from people. Ed said something at the end there that got me a little choked up. I'm on the British Farming Forum group on Facebook, and every year when it comes time to shear the wool and sell it to the British Wool Board, the forum fills with shepherds who are utterly frustrated and demoralized by the experience because they receive so little for their wool. So many of them opt to burn their fleeces instead. Some do gardening or crop agriculture on their farms as well, and they're able to use it as fertilizer. But because it's just not worth it to send their yarn off to be processed by the wool board. And so to think about the contrast between the sheep growers who are burning their wool because it's useless for them and what that must do to them mentally versus those who are finding ways to create their own product out of it and the sense of pride and accomplishment that they have, the difference between those two is just heartbreaking. I'm so glad that there are wool producers out there who are finding ways to get their products into the hands of those who appreciate it and are benefiting from the sense of self-respect that comes from that. And if it means we get wonderful wool to work with as a result, more's the better. Thank you again to Nick and Ed, not just for coming on the show, but for taking the initiative to get this wool into our hands. I know it is extra work to make it happen, but we wool nerds definitely appreciate it. All the links for the project will be in the show notes. If you can, show them some love. The pledge levels start at just five British pounds. A few more things before I go. I am off to Shetland next Monday. I'll be there working on a special project. Christy Glass hosts online knitting retreats called Knit and Escape, and she asked for my help in putting together a special day-long event centered on Shetland and Shetland Wool Week. So I'm headed there to help film a collection of lessons and presentations and experiences for that event. Shetland Day is happening on September 25th, and registration for Knit and Escape should be opening up shortly if it's not already open by the time this episode goes live. Learn more and register at knitandescape.com. There are still a handful of slots open in my Mac and in Shetland dialect class that is happening as part of Virtual Shetland Wool Week this year. The class is split into two two-hour sessions that will run on September 27th and the 31st starting each day at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. My teaching partner will be Vivica Velupulai from Uradale Farm. I will be teaching what you need to know to knit the autumn wrist warmers designed by Hilly Vandersloos. If you want to join in, I strongly, 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 strongly recommend that you visit uradale.com slash collections slash webinars to register for the class and have the kit sent to you so you can use the Uradale yarn for the class, though you also have the option to knit it with appropriate yarn from your stash. Also, while you are there, there are classes in natural dyeing and Helene Dresen is offering a thrummed mittens class. My class is really designed for Fair Isle newbies, but Vivica will also be presenting her talk on Shetland dialect knitting terms in the first class. And in the second class, she'll be talking about the practices they use at Uradale Farm to organically and sustainably raise their wool. So if you are not new to Fair Isle Knitting but want to come for the lectures, you're absolutely welcome. Don't forget about more House Open Farm Day on October 15th. I hope to see you there. I should be back in two weeks with another episode. In the meantime, 
thank you for listening and knitting with me for a bit. If you'd like to support the show, please visit patreon.com slash I thought I knew how to make a monthly pledge. You may also consider making a purchase from one of our sponsors by visiting the website I thought I knew how.com and clicking the link at the top that says be a booster. While you're on the site, you can also find the show notes for each episode. Thank you ever so much to my patrons, Knit New Haven and Morehouse Farm for supporting the podcast. Find me on my social media accounts as I thought I knew how, except on Twitter, where it's just thought I knew how. The groups on various platforms are all called I Thought I Knew How Podcast. Until next time, may you be blessed with stitches that never drop, yarn without joins, and plenty of time to knit. <laughs>